welcome to the show, Donna Cameron. I miss you, Donna. <laughs> it's okay, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> I know, right? And it's kind of like good and bad that I haven't seen you because you are a working and qualified psychologist and have been for 20 years. Mm-hmm. So the fact that I haven't seen you for a while is probably a positive. <laughs> it's funny because I'm only 21 still. So, I mean, I'm probably going to have to increase my age eventually to the kids, aren't I? I, I went through that. That's a whole story. Uh, okay. Was, <laughs> that's another podcast. That's, that's another podcast. But it's when me... the kids start saying, hold on a sec. If our sister's 19 and you're still only 21... Hmm. <laughs> You're like, damn those teachers for teaching you maths. Well, you are saying exactly what happened to me. <laughs> my daughter was turning 21 when Ashley, who you know, my youngest, mm-hmm. said to me, Mum, how does that work out if you're 21? How can Jessie be 21 too? And I said, oh, no, she's act- I'm actually turning 22 next birthday. <laughs> <laughs> And she believed it, bless. <laughs> anyway, Aww. we're here today to talk about something a little bit more serious, but in the hope that it will help other people. So mm-hmm. we're going to talk about grief and loss. And how serendipitous is this? We are both wearing black, which is, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how that Not works. planned. Not planned. <laughs> And I never wear black on a podcast. But anyway, we're both in black, so we're looking very mournful. (laughs) But, Donna, you moved to Melbourne about a year or so ago, and Mm -hmm. Melbourne experienced some of the biggest lockdowns of any country, like of any city in the world. Mm -hmm. So how was that experience for you? Like, did you go through any loss or grief during that time yourself? Mm, Yeah, no, 100%. And the weird thing, I guess, for us was coming from Queensland and in, let's do the years because it ended up being longer than we all hoped. So 2020, being in Queensland, I was working with a lot of people in Melbourne still and building, because we knew we were on the move. So I was down here kind of via this (laughs) forum, Mm -hmm. um, probably, you know, 30, 40 hours a week. And you really got the sense of, I kind of get this. Like I understand they're going through the grief and loss system. You're kind of trying to explain it to them, but you you sort of, you know, you can see it, but you sort of just didn't really get it. And then when we got here in 2021 and thinking everything will be okay this year and it all happened again, and we got to kind of experience it for the second time round, I was really, really shocked. So not a lot in my personal life changed. Um, I still went to the office every day and offered people if they needed to come to me that they could still come to me, even though yes. most of it was over Zoom. Um, you know, I'm I'm the worker in my household, so usually it is my husband that stays at home with the kids. So he was doing the normal kids stuff that he would do. And I'd get home at the same time. We'd have dinner. You know, I'm pretty boring during the week. We'd be in bed watching some Netflix at still 8 o'clock, mm-hmm. asleep, get up. All of that was pretty normal. Got the exercise equipment at home, was still doing spin class. Everything was was kind of normal. But a few months into it, I actually escaped up there, up to Queensland in before one of ours kicked in for a weekend. And I was scared I was going to miss my sister's wedding. And I rang yeah. my husband and I said, do you know what? I was up for the hens, a really important part. <laughs> and I said, I'm really scared I'm going to miss the wedding. It's only six weeks away. I think I need to stay. And he had a complete meltdown. And I just went, what? And he said, you've got to come home. I'm not coping. And I went, but we're not that clingy couple. We go away all the time. I work away a lot. Like I said, he normally deals with the kids. And I just could not get my head around it. We were just having fights every night on the phone because I'm saying, but I need this. And he's going, I don't know what it is, but I need you home. So I came home. You guys went into lockdown. So then the wedding was cancelled. So that was all okay. Okay. <laughs> And from that point on, it just got worse and worse down here. And the 
grief and losses that kicked in then for us were the simple things. It was not being able to go and see, you know, a family member or catch up with friends. It, the 5K rule just messed with every Victorian's head. Yes. The curfew, I, like I said, I'm not out at 10 o'clock on a weeknight, but the fact that you were told you couldn't, it just took you to this whole other level. Mm-hmm. Then you would get the, the, the Facebook posts of my family up there, you know, out for a beautiful lunch or mm-hmm. people on holidays. And in 2020, I didn't get it. I was posting those photos. And in 2021, like I wanted to kill them all. <laughs> like I'm surprised my iPhone lasted. You just wanted to throw it in that rage. Yes. So at the end of it, I really thought, wow, I did not expect, you know, I talked to everyone about that you will have a lot of different grief and losses is because you'll miss a lot of things in life. And I can justify all of those, but I didn't understand that it would just even be the simplest things of your daily routine, even if you kept it pretty similar, it just smashed everyone down here. Mm, I know. And I, because I have family in Melbourne, in fact, all my family is in Melbourne. How long was that last lockdown for? Because it, it was a long time. And it was about the fourth one in Melbourne. Yeah, so basically, so we were in lockdown this time now. Um, all my Facebook memories are saying day three. We'd had a couple of little ones before this one kicked in. We came out of this one for maybe two weeks and then we went back in it. Um, I'm trying to think. I think the total count, day count, I wrote a lot of stuff about this. I think we went over like 300 or 300 days or something in lockdown like as oh as a total gosh. it was it was so, it was a huge number correct me if i'm wrong with that number wow, i wrote it down a lot of times but yes. it was it was a huge number and yes. that last one then it was almost worse the last one because we kind of did two weeks in two weeks out 10 days in one week out and then we're in till november or december mm. Um, and at that same time for the last one, New South Wales was just hitting their their kind of first one again. And it was kind of at that point, all the attention was on the next state who was kind of going through it. And it was yes. almost like, oh, yeah, that's remember those Victorians. Oh, no, they're used to it by now. <laughs> oh, I know my family never got used to it. And I yeah. think about my poor old mum who was who spent, you know, the last c- couple of years of her life in lockdown. But yeah. And that's the reason why I've asked you to be on the show is I lost my mum last month and it made me realise that I'm not the only one. You know, um, okay, my grief is because of the death of someone that's close to me, Mm -hmm. but so many people over the past couple of years have experienced some kind of loss and are grieving or have grieved. It could be the loss of their income. It could be the loss of a relationship. It could be the loss of their civil liberties or the the loss of um, loved ones who have passed through COVID. I mean, and, and now, and then we had the floods here in Australia. We've had the, the fires. And now there's a war in Ukraine. I mean, the world feels like it's going mad. And it it just made me realize, hey, you're not the only one. And people, everyone is going through something of their own. So in your practice, have you seen a different type of grief or loss coming through over the past couple of years? And what is that? Yeah. So the easiest way to explain this, I guess, as well, yep. is when we first went into this, we had a lot of media contact. Anyone who was working in the media as a psych was obviously hot property and all the topics were COVID. And the conversation back then was saying, aren't you worried about your anxious people, your depressed people? Like, oh my gosh, how are they going to cope? And I mm-hmm. said to them back then, I'm not worried about those people. They've got their coping strategies. I'm actually worried about the normal normal people who have never seen a psych before. And I actually said the example was, and I'm worried about them because they're about to experience a lot of grief and loss and they're not going to be able to pin pocket. And the difficulty is going to be that they can't describe it. So obviously, you know, if somebody couldn't 
get to a family member, you know, and we personally, I personally experienced this as well. We couldn't get to a family member in another state when they were passing. That's kind of understandable, right? So when we're losing our mind and rocking in the corner and angry, everybody's looking at us and going, oh, well, that makes sense. Poor you. So you get that attention and people let you go through your grief and loss process for those moments. Mm -hmm. But when I've missed a holiday or when I've missed, I do the R&B live concerts with my sisters every year and, you know, I've missed that or I've missed a nail appointment. (laughs) Those routines. And the lashes. And the lashes. Yes. They don't make sense to people. So how do I go and talk to one of my friends or family members who might have lost their job or couldn't get to see family and say to them, oh, I'm really struggling, I'm feeling really sad. Oh, why, Donna? Oh, because I haven't got to go to those concerts that I have planned this year, you know? Mm -hmm. So where does all of that go? And the problem with our emotional system or the emotional hub or the stress cup that I kind of refer to it is it does not care about the detail. So when we activate grief and loss, we activate an emotion. It doesn't jump up to our head to say, hey, Donna, what are you grieving about? Are you grieving about R&B Fridays or your nails or, you know, not seeing, Mm -hmm. you know, a family member? Mm -hmm. It doesn't care. It just activates it. And if we don't go through at least validating that emotion and doing some form of a release of it, it stays there. And what happens with anything in our system if it just piles in and stays there? It comes out in other ways. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes us unhealthy in the interim. So a lot of the clients and a lot of the ones that shifted was exactly what I predicted. I started getting the non-anxious, non-depressed people, people who never would have thought that they'd be sitting on the couch of a psychologist, you know, 25 year old guys who can't get themselves to the pub to have a drink anymore because they just cry all the time or business people who have actually done the best in COVID financially but they just have no joy in life and they can't get that spark back. You know, Mm. they're the people who are coming through and they just have no idea and they just need to understand it to be able to process it. So how would you then describe grief? Like what is grief? Because Mm -hmm. you can feel sad, but at what point does it become grief? Is there a difference? So I think we've got to look at the spectrum of emotions and a lot of the times I kind of look at it like a spectrum and we've got the happy and joy and excitement and they're all just different levels really of happy because mm-hmm. we, we want to be simple here, right? So we break yes. it into good and bad. <laughs> yes. And then down the other end, we've got these ones that we classify as bad emotions and they're our anger and our, our sadness and our depression and all of those sort of feelings. Usually the best way to kind of describe it is your grief and loss is your king right so it's it's number one it's the worst emotion that you will actually when we're saying and remember i don't believe emotions are bad but i'm going to use language that we all use now yes it's the worst emotion that you will ever feel it hurts the most so it's the king emotion on that spectrum so as humans we will do anything we can to avoid ever experiencing that emotion when somebody dies we kind of have to go through it. There's still a lot of blocking and all of those little things that we can try and do, but you can't pretend, you know, we can't pretend that family member is still there because they're not. Mm. So our body kind of gets pushed through it and we have to go through the stages eventually. Mm-hmm. When there's something else that's like a breakup or a job thing or a money thing, we can block it because we can pretend it hasn't happened. We can avoid feeling that emotion. And we can try and minimize that emotion. Oh, look, other people have got it worse. That's okay. Look, I wanted to change jobs anyway. Like all of that sort of stuff. Yes. But we just do anything we can to kind of block it if we can, because it's yes. the worst. It hurts the most. So you, you use the word hurt. Now, I know that when my mum passed away, I actually felt physical pain too. Mm-hmm. And one I can't explain. But there was a physicality to that pain. So Mm -hmm. what are the usual symptoms, both physical and emotional, that people will experience when they're grieving? 
Yeah, so I think that physical pain also, especially when it's a death and it's a death of somebody, you know, that's part of you, it's been part of your life energetically. I think there's a lot that happens when you lose, especially a family member. And a lot of the times, even those close friendships, you know, people we call as our family. Yes. It's almost like, you know, so many stories, which I love, all those stories where people can be in different locations, different places, and they Mm. can feel when that goes and they just drop and they can just feel that intense pain. I feel that intense pain is very much that shock. The whole body just goes into that shock and we hold it really tightly as well. And so, the so heart... Even though we know it's going to happen, even mm-hmm. though we know that mm-hmm. it's, and it's going to be happening very soon, we still mm-hmm. experience that, Bill saying. Mm-hmm. Yep, we still don't want to ever predict as human beings the end. We don't like it. Like we're we're not good at this in our culture. I don't think we're really good in Australia at, at it as well. I think there's a lot of cultures that do do grief and loss with people actually passing quite beautifully. I think in Australia we're really, we just don't want it. <laughs> we don't like it. Mm. So you can prepare yourself mentally, but again, your emotional hub hasn't activated properly yet. So as soon as that person's gone and whether you're with them or you're not and you get that phone call and you know there is no more chances for you to fix this, we all want it to still be fixable, right? So I know, I know your story. I know your mum was, was, has, has had a great life. I know she was even age-wise was, was getting up there. 99, yeah. And but it doesn't matter. Months. It doesn't matter. We still, want a, we still want something to come and say, mm. no, it's okay. You're going to be okay. We've actually solved that problem and you're going to get even another six months, even another week. Like we still have hope until it's gone. And when that light's gone, then it all kicks in. And so that physical pain is a real release of the body and a lot of that shock and a lot of the tension. And for some people, it's everything they've even been holding on maybe for that last week or a couple of weeks, not looking after themselves. Like it's just a big explosion of everything coming out. And, you know, that heart pain, you know, I think everybody, and I'm not a scientist, so I can't even give an explanation on that, but those real intense grief and loss, this is what we call that heartbreak. It hurts. And it hurts in that area. Yes. Yes. And then in terms of the emotional symptoms, like all Mm -hmm. things that we experience as part of that grief. Yeah, so look, the top five, it's been around for a long time, the the stages of grief and loss, we all like oh, yes. to kind of, you know, yes. I think Frazier's done a good episode on it where they kind of, you know, he pretends he's not going through it and they keep on putting it through. Um, so it's pretty accurate. So, you know, we kick off with that denial. <laughs> um, and I think that's when that shock kind of happens. Yes. And the denial, it's just normal. We don't want it to be real. Um, so the denial will kick in. got to remember with these five stages you don't just it's not a beautiful process that you just flow through one and come through the other side i sort of say that it's almost like a little bit of like one of those circles it's almost like you start with one and you dip into the next and then you dip into three and then you might dump one and dip into two and kind of come around um after denial we hit the anger and you know this is when a lot of people will try and then suppress that because we don't want to really feel angry or people tell us that we shouldn't feel angry in this scenario. Mm. Depending on the circumstance of, of, of especially death, we get yes. more permission sometimes to be angry if it's can a younger I, person. Yep. Yeah. Can I just ask you, um, with that anger, can that be directed at something else, not necessarily to that situation or relating to the death, but you can mm-hmm. redirect that anger into something else? Oh, yeah, everything. People breathing around you can bug you. You know, that pasta okay. that you ordered now wasn't El Dente. <laughs> yeah. I've been through it. Okay. Yep. Yep. I'm just saying. Yep. Because, again, remember this system, it doesn't care how it releases. It just needs to release. Mm-hmm. So if somebody's on a train and they're talking mm-hmm. too loudly, you're going to want to go and hit them in the head. Or, or yeah, you just order, go to your favorite cafe to get your coffee and it doesn't have the milk you want. You want to just scream your head off. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. Looks been like I've been through that. Because <laughs> <'Cause> I, <laughs> I actually, um, you know, I always do my research before I interview someone and I read up on the five stages and I went, I was never angry. And now, oh. Like, oh, actually, I think I may have been, but not directed it in yep. the direction of uh, the death, no. but someone else on the other side of the fence who we've spoken about 
who have been very annoying. <laughs> There's been a oh, lot of Oh, they copped channels. it a little bit. Yeah. Oh, no, so... not, not, not in person. <laughs> But no. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's your little anger stage. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and then we've got your bargaining. So your bargaining just mm. is again just wishing it hadn't happened. It's this is a lot of head stuff, right? This is the stuff oh you do gosh. in the privacy of your own kind of yes. bedroom. This is oh the my whole. Gosh. Yeah. Why I did this? T you know, back I guess back in the religious terms, it was take me, not them, that sort of stuff. Oh, um, these okay. days, I think it's still a lot of like, just why, and it's not fair. And what could mm. I've done to stop this? And well, should, I mean, yes. your mum was down in Melbourne, a lot of guilt stuff can come through. Should I've seen her more? Should I've called I her more? With COVID. Yep. Yep. I, I, yep. I, yep. I missed out on a year. Yep. But mm -hmm. what you're saying about that bargaining, oh my gosh, that makes total sense. Is that my brother and I had to make the decision to for there to be no intervention. Mm -hmm. yeah. And my mother had made her wishes very clear that she didn't want intervention mm -hmm. And in the end. And yeah. my brother and I were power of attorney and we had to make that call with the staff at the hospital. And mm. that was the thing that I you know, talking about um, the denial and maybe mm -hmm. I, I didn't realise the impact that had on me till once I was home and I woke up in the middle yeah. of the night and the responsibility yeah. that I felt and that goes into that bargaining. Yeah, you know, what could I have done? Did we make I the done? right decision? Oh my yeah. gosh, that, that mm -hmm. actually was the hardest thing mm. For yeah. me to cope with once I was home and the shock had worn off was yeah. and, and can you see how that, that almost links your bargaining can almost link back into the denial though oh my gosh you know so much. if I'd been able to do this maybe that wouldn't have happened and then all yes. of a sudden we're living in this moment even if it's just a split moment of time of mm -hmm. 30 seconds we're living in a moment of time that that person's not gone for a second mm -hmm. right and yes. so that that's where I mean that real link can kind of happen still and then you can oh, it's happened you come out of denial and then get angry again mm. so it's not just a nice kind of yep easy slide process yes yep. and what happens after the bargaining or is there... oh then the fun bit the nice oh. depression stage <laughs> I don't really like the word depression. Again, it's just on the spectrum of emotions. It's just everyone now hears depression and goes, I'm depressed. It's sad. It's just feeling flat. It's just you've got nothing left in your tank. You've just been through a death. You've been through denial, anger, bargaining. Being up on that intense level of that spectrum of emotions, they take a lot out of us, yes. right? And we're yes. not normally looking after ourselves in this time. Go find me one grief and loss person who's also then eating well, drinking well, sleeping well, not happening. No. So of course you're going to get flat. Of course you're going to get, I would prefer that stage to actually probably be, just be called burnt out, like done. I'd actually prefer that just to be called done. I'm just done. Yeah. Had enough. I just need a moment. I've got yeah. nothing left. Tank's yes. empty. Yes. Leave Absolutely. me alone yeah. for a few months and I'll probably be okay. Yeah. But I'm just done. Yeah. I think I'm still in that one. Yeah. I'm and I think again, yeah, energy levels yeah. are down and blah, 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 yes. Yeah, and that's all right. I don't think yeah. there needs to, and there doesn't need to be a time frame on any of these things. And then we get to that magical acceptance. Oh. <laughs> Again, there needs to be a bit of a, a side point. Most people, when they go through a grief and a loss, it, acceptance doesn't mean 100% or better now. Acceptance just means that maybe I can get through my daily life and maybe I'm not crying. You know, maybe my tears have turned into I'm crying every day to now I've got through a week and I don't need to take those breaks from things anymore. I'm OK. But it doesn't mean that maybe on a weekend when you're by yourself, you still don't have to have a moment. So acceptance doesn't have to mean I'm OK. It just means I know that my person's gone. I know that part has, has gone, yeah. but I've still I've got a lot of recovering to do. Yeah. So for me, that means that I'm not going to be running out of a Pilates cr class crying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're hoping everyone. that you can you can get through your Pilates <laughs> and not make everyone, you know, oh, running behind you. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. But still a lot of healing. And we talk about, you know, people who have lost, you know, partners young, people who have lost children. That's just a whole other topic all on itself. It's never about being okay with grief and you're allowed to not be okay with grief we just have to also have that part that our life has to be able to go on and we've got to find how we do that so for some people grief and loss might be like an it it might be like an injury and i don't again see a problem in this if we can just acknowledge it and it might be like i've just you know broken my arm and it takes a bit to heal and it, all of a sudden it's back to normal and I can still do everything, but sometimes in the cold it gets sore and I might not now be able to ski or snowboard or whatever. So there might still be some consequences in my life, but I've got a bit of an injury. And I don't see that as a depressive way to see it. I think that's a very realistic way that some people get to say, no, this person has gone from me. My life will never be the same as what it was. I'm gonna be okay, but I'm also acknowledging that I will have this little part of me that I will miss for the rest of my time as well. And that's okay. Yes, because we're all different and everyone handles things differently. And one thing that I gave myself permission to do was to feel my feelings in the moment. Yes, I I actually did. I gave myself permission. I had that talk Mm -hmm. with myself and Mm -hmm. I've cried in front of students. I've cried in front of my bosses. Uh, Mm -hmm. I've cried, as I said, I ran out of a Pilates class crying, something triggered (laughs) in the class and it wasn't Mm -hmm. anything hurting other than a broken heart in that moment. And so we all deal with things differently. And do you feel then if someone is grieving over say a relationship, so it's a breakup, Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. you've been with someone for X number of years or not, it could be a girl that's been with a boyfriend for uh, some time and mm-hmm. and they're dumped mm-hmm. do you do do they grieve differently to someone then who's gone through a death mm-hmm. so as i said the grief and loss system activates the same emotion mm-hmm. the difference is because that person's still there it's yes. like it doesn't ha- have to activate that real they're gone forever But (laughs) this doesn't sometimes make it easier for the actual situation they've got to go through. Mm -hmm. And again, not to, and I always say very, very, I always say if I'm talking to my clients with this, I'm not disrespecting anybody who's passed because that is the most horrific thing you will ever go through. I'm talking on the emotional level now though. So I'm not talking as our human kind of brain. When we go through a breakup, the hardest bit, sometimes the process to go through those steps can be harder than somebody actually passing. And this is the reason. I said before, we want to avoid grief and loss at all costs, right? Yes. So I've just gone through a breakup. I'm feeling really, really shitty. I've done a little bit of the yelling, the screaming, the girlfriends have all come around. We've eaten the ice cream. We've drunk the wine. We've done whatever we want to do. But then my head goes, oh, hold on. I left my sock at his place. I need that sock. I don't need the sock, but I get to go and I get to see that person. And in that moment, there's no grief and loss. Because the system goes, well, if they're there, you must be fine. So we cannot activate. We stop, stop the activation, abort the mission. So I feel better for a second. And then I leave and then the system goes, oh God, what the hell's going on? Oh, we've got to activate it again. So the breakup grief and loss can be on again. We've all, don't we? We've all got those people that just need to break up with that person, but they won't break up with that person. And yes, whether you were yes. in the girlfriends when you were like seven, you know, 17 or, or later, and you hear them and it's all this they don't stop texting they don't stop just running into each other this is and the problem with breakups is you've got two people both avoiding the grief and loss process and lots of opportunities to Mm -hmm. accidentally catch up or see each other to pause that process so that process can be a lot more winded (laughs) and a lot of a lot more ways to avoid it yeah Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and because in one sense I don't want to say that it's worse because it's not worse, mm. but it's in maybe it's harder because that person is still around. And you maybe- just can't finalize the process. Yes. So if we're talking just grief and loss, if it was a different system that we went through for breakup, then we'd be going through the breakup system. But unfortunately, it's the same system, and you just a lot of people don't ever finalize it. Mm. 
And sometimes it's impossible to find, it's harder, not impossible to finalize it. If you've got a couple who have broken up and they've got young kids, they have to communicate. The first thing we try and get you to not do to deal with the grief and loss is not communicate. So there's lots of circumstances that also makes those grief and loss processes harder. So how do we get to that point of acceptance? What is the best way to heal? Mm -hmm. So it's almost, you summed it up before, it's what you gave yourself permission to do. You have to understand that it is a process and you have to understand that these emotions are there and they're going to come through and you need to allow them to come through. So even you before potentially saying, oh, I didn't really do that anger side, now you can see how it's come through. It is good. You can kind of go, oh, good, I have kind of ticked that off. And this is what I need people doing. I do need people looking at that list, the top five, and kind of eventually, even if it's a a couple of months later, going, okay, no, I do think I've done all of those stages and I don't think I've blocked any emotions associated with it. And making sure you give yourself that time. Everybody will give themselves permission to normally cry and, you know, sometimes a little bit get angry. But again, there's a time frame of when that's acceptable, when our friends think time's up, when we should get back out there, when we should be over it, all of that sort of stuff. And it's just saying, okay, life has to go on, but do I still need some moments to check in on my emotions? How am I going? Do I need to release a little bit still, mm-hmm. you know, even a few months later? And I always talk to my grief and loss people and say, you will have those times and almost in a weird way, celebrating those times where you can get to the end of the week and go, wow, I didn't cry this week. Like, that's really cool. And then it might be a month. You know, I remember going through a horrific, horrific grief and loss in my life. And I remember the first time that I went, wow, that was a month. I got through a month without having, you know, a tear. And I wasn't upset that I was still needing the tears. Mm -hmm. I was allowing those. But it was just good to kind of see that because I'd allowed it, the body wasn't needing them as much anymore. And that then you can kind of get some energy back and you'll feel your energy coming back if you release the emotions. If you don't release the emotions, you'll stay quite fatigued and then that's going to be harder because you're blocking them all. And we always know when you're blocking something down, it's going to burn more energy in yourself. So then everything's just going to be difficult. So you might think you're coping fine. But, you know, you can't get through a work day or you're not cooking still or you can't be bothered catching up with friends because you're just too exhausted. Mm. The other issue, too, that I think, and this is talking from my own experiences because I did go through loss and grief 30-odd years ago. I had my first husband committed suicide and then I lost my father about 15 months later. So there there were significant losses back to back. Mm -hmm. And I, back then, I made the decision as a very young person Mm -hmm. that I was going to be stoic. (laughs) This one's not going to be Donna approved, is it? I could tell. No, this is, this is, I was going to, on the exterior, Mm -hmm. I was going to be brave because I felt there was shame Mm -hmm. in showing those emotions of sadness and crying. I thought there was shame around that. And I ended up with an eating disorder and I ended Mm -hmm. up very unwell. My whole system shut down where I didn't menstruate for five years. Yeah. So my body did not have it. So obviously there's bad ways to grieve. So is lack of acknowledgement the worst thing that you can do? Yeah, look, there's... Again, there's sort of the jokes of the, you know, the eating or the drinking or the, or sometimes even the drug use, you know, anything to get you through those initial stages, there's yeah. no judgment I'm past the, the yes. there's no judgment and there yes. needs to not be judgment. I've got no problem with the person who's burying, you know, a family member or anyone who needs, you know, some Valiums to get them through, you know, those couple of weeks, whatever. It's making sure that whatever little vices you might need to do, you also just have that time to feel shit and to let the emotion out. So you, you know, I guess an example is when I went through mine, you know, I, I'm a, this is my business. I'm the only one here, you know, in, in psychology, you kind of can't just get someone else to pop in and see you 30, 40 patients, you know, a week it doesn't work that way. I haven't got a fill in. And I remember I made a deal with my emotional hub and the deal was that I had to get through the work day. 
and oh my gosh and of course everyone comes in with the similar stuff because the universe really plays with you at that time yeah. but the deal was i have to get <laughs> through so the work right. day mm-hmm. yep i have to get through my work day but i promise you at the end of my work day i will have a hot shower and i will lose my mind i will do whatever you need me to do i will cry i will yell in the shower i will just drop my shoulders if i'm exhausted that will be my deal so if i do this deal with you please let me get through my work day without needing to run out and it worked because i did that i could do both so this is as well what people kind of need to just understand your body will still let you do what you need to do you know i get that there's a lot of parents that can't break down because they've still got to go to work or they have to deal with children or situations you just have to make a deal with the emotion as well and it will do it it's just not going to play fair when you block it all in and hold it all in it will keep it will shut your system down there's no that, that's that's not a that's a non-negotiable it will happen mm. it's just whether it will happen in 5 months or 5 years mm. well as a psychologist i'm assuming that most people would come to you when they are at their worst in the grieving <laughs> process because people wouldn't think to go to a psychologist if they're grieving unless mm-hmm. it gets to that point where they can't stop crying or whatever's going on or mm-hmm. however they're dealing with it or unless they can't stop being angry but um sorry i forgot where i was going with this so what then is the time frame like Mm. When would you then, as a professional, get to a point where you go, that's way too long, there's something, we've got to sort this out, this has just gone on too long? Um, Again, it's hard to say. I think, I think when I, when you sort of say that, I think about kind of routines and patterns that we go through. And I think most we don't want to really be stuck in a new routine or a new pattern. This almost takes us back to lockdown really for more than three months. Okay. Like let's just, and this is not, this is just me as a professional throwing this at you. This isn't covered by any amazing, you know, stats or data or anything. This is just what I, I see yes, in, your, in my practice. In your practice, yes. So anything over three months, our system starts learning that as our new normal. So I would want to see some progress of getting back into your old life or some systems back in place before that three month mark hit. You don't have to, again, not be crying. You can still be heartbroken. You can still be going through a lot of the emotions, but I'd like to see you kind of getting through, you know, a couple of, I'd I'd like you being able to, you know, get up, have your shower, be eating something, you know, maybe if you've got the young children, getting them to school, just some basic kind of activities. If you haven't returned back to work, that would maybe still be okay, but you'd be starting to think about, you know, where does that kind of fit in? Then between three to six months, if there's no improvement, again, now we're doubling, that's our new normal times two. I'd be really kind of concerned probably at that six month mark if you you really still can't even think about, you know, getting back to work or doing some some normal life routines. Um, I'd I'd be worried then that you were just so stuck in it. And again, remember everything's fixable, but you were just so stuck in it of how long this was going to help get you back into your normal again which will take at least another three months <laughs> you know to sort of process i had a client um come in once and she was she was a, a an elderly lady and she just hadn't done any of the work and her her husband had passed about five years ago oh, and wow. she just was so stuck hadn't oh. even still been able to move the medication or the toiletries from the bathroom oh. Yeah, and that's just because there was just so much to do at the start and she just didn't do get any help for it. And she knew, she and she said to me, I knew I needed to do this sooner. And everyone will, everyone always says that. So I think you've got to really listen to your own mind and people around you. People around you eventually will say, oh, do you think you should see someone? <laughs> you know, and they'll say it in the most delicate way, but you've got to just listen to that. Mm. And but, when... Yeah. When it comes to other people, though, people handle you as the person that's going through the grief process Mm -hmm. differently. Mm -hmm. You have people, let's say, some people, they they may say, oh, you need to toughen up. You know, Mm -hmm. not directly at me, but someone that's maybe going through a relationship breakup. They'll say, Mm -hmm. come on, mate, 
you know, you get you need to get back on the horse again. Come on, yep. best way to get over it, or if someone loses a pet, just go and buy another one. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> someone loses their job, come on. You know, there's plenty of jobs out there. With me, probably the worst thing that I was told yeah. because oh, I was actually, I had people handling the situation really beautifully. In fact, people were so kind and mm -hmm. and said all the right things mm -hmm. that it made me cry more but that was a good thing because you know yep. get it out of the system but so i was fortunate i didn't face people that were telling me time heals mm -hmm. i didn't have people were <laughs> acknowledging my grief but she's in a better place love that one no they're not the better place was in their house with me no. <laughs> well the worst thing that i probably probably was told was oh well she was 99 years old yes yep yep yeah and that's a that's a great one yeah and I go well you know funny about that because you know there's not an expiry date when it's your mum your mum yep. is your mum and just and she didn't stop being my mum at 90 she was mm -hmm. still my mum mm -hmm. so as yep. people how do we then, what are the right things that we should be saying to someone that's mm -hmm. going through a difficult time? So I think all of those is our own uncomfortability with grief and loss and emotions. And we all just want to get people happy again. So, hey, yeah. you know, she did really well. Like 99, that's a good innings. Like, mm -hmm. oh, it's just redirect. Just look at the person. Just how are you feeling? It's a simple line. You don't actually even need to make up anything to make them smile. They don't want to yes. smile. Yes. How are you feeling? I'm feeling really shitty. I'm really missing her. Validate the emotion. Oh my gosh, of course you are. She was your mum. You're allowed to feel sad. Anything I can do to help with that, done. Validate, offer for help, done. Don't problem solve it and don't give these stupid lines. I know, and they are really <laughs> stupid lines. I can tell mm. you. <laughs> that I've actually got a client. I've got a client um, who went through a loss of um, a husband and she's writing a book about the grief and loss process. She's oh, probably, wow. I don't know, about maybe 70% through it. And one of her chapters is going to be on that. What not to say when somebody dies. Mm. Well, what mm. is the worst thing we can say? Do you feel? I, I think it's just all of that. I think it's like, I think it's the rushing of the emotions. I think it's the whole like they're in a better place or 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 it's anything that dismisses anything even just yes. that she was 99 it's a dismissal of yes. what does that even mean i think yes. these throwaway lines what do they even mean they're in a better place what does that mean what if i'm not religious well what mm. no they're in the ground how's that a better place like just mm. be really sensible of who you're even giving that message to mm. so i think it's just anything anything that's just a minimization of your loss in any mm. situation like the job thing oh you'll find a better one well, what if I don't? What if I really loved my job? You don't know that. Just yeah. let me be really sad that I've lost my job right now. How are you feeling about losing your job? Really pissed off. Of course you are. That's okay. Yes. Do you need anything about that? Yeah, I just need to bloody go for a freaking drive or a scream. Cool, I'll come over. I'll drive. Like yeah. I drive, you scream. But can I borrow <laughs> your headphones? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, but every line. So I think I think every line. So don't try and be creative. Don't try and be smart. Every line is a stupid line unless it's how are you feeling and that's okay. Yes. And just being, yeah, just someone acknowledging and validating, mm. I think, was the thing that most people did with me, like 99% of people did that with mm -hmm. me. And I was surprised and, and it was very comforting. Yeah. And I think as a society, we can all do better. Yeah. At Look, at link it back. Let's, but let's link it back. Let's link it back even to what we started talking about, even with the COVID, you know, oh, but think of all of the, think of all the money you save by not being able to go out to a restaurant or like they were the stupid comments. Oh, but you know, it's okay. You didn't want to do that anyway. You know, like, oh, you just would have eaten some whatever, you know, you did. it was just all of these stupid comments. I can't, it mustn't have been that bad. Oh, this was a great one. It mustn't have been that bad. Like I can't, I, I really would love some time just to chill out at home. <gasps> Try doing that yeah. for a year. <laughs> oh you know, I really need to spring clean my cupboards. You're so lucky that you got the time to do that. I haven't oh. had time to cook. 
Yeah, it was anyone was just anything, anything that's just a real dismissal. Whereas the dismissal. best thing would have been, how was exactly what you, how was lockdown for you? It was really shitty. Yeah, oh, it really looked like it was tough. Yeah, it was. Mm. Done. Mm. Don't try and compare it. You know, don't have, if you haven't lived something, don't ever try and compare the situation to what you've been through. Yes. And that was another thing that a couple of people that had been through the loss of their mums, mm -hmm. they were the ones who gave the greatest comfort yeah. in, in saying how they felt mm -hmm. and validating on a different level. That, that was the best. Yeah. But let's have a little bit of a gender competition here. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of men and women, Mm -hmm. Do we handle grief differently, generally? Oh, yes. Because not everyone's the same, of course. No, not everyone's the same. And the problem with our beautiful men out there is they jump straight into what they're best known for, the problem solving. So they jump into the whole, we don't, we don't want to deal with this emotional stuff. We don't have emotions. We're men. So let's just get stuff done. Yes. So they rush through it. Yeah, they yeah. do things My too brother. quickly. Mm -hmm. Yep. And a lot of the times then it will catch up to them or they'll hold it all in. And we've already talked about what happens when they hold it all in. Um, to be fair, the generation's coming through a little bit more in touch with their emotions. Um, seeing a lot of changes now with that. But definitely our generations of sort of still our 40-year-olds pluses, they just don't think that they mm. need to do any of these emotions. I think for most men... They might actually even say the only time they've probably ever cried has been the death of a loved one. And so they kind of have that initial cry. And then especially if they've got a, you know, a female around them or daughters or wives or family members or sisters, they kind of then have to deal with that emotion. So they'll come in then as that protector and then the problem solver. But they can just take it a bit too fast, too soon and stuff mm. it up a little bit. Yes, I've had that situation a weekend ago with my brother and I had to sit him down quietly and say, I, I'm dealing with mum's stuff because this is the way that you need to deal with the grief and I'm compromising and respecting how you feel. Now it's time for you to do the same for me because I wasn't ready to do this yeah. and enough now, you need to stop no more till I'm ready and that is going to be your compromise. That was, and my brother understood that when I put it in those terms and he was respectful. But how do we as women generally, how do we let men know, hey, this is not okay and what I'm feeling is different to you. And I think, because I think the biggest thing for me was, was my brother saying, oh, when I die, I just want you to throw everything out. I'm going, how does this, how does this come back around to you right now? <laughs> oh, it's just, they're just so, we're, we're all so complicated. Really, it's about, because this is our problem, right? So the emotional hub is just going, as you know, and you felt, you've recently felt. And when the emotional hub is taking over, this system here is normally not very helpful. And, and even at its moments of helpfulness, it's hard to even articulate words or put, you know, assertion into place. So the fact that you were even able to do that just is, is, is your skill set as well, a skill set that you've got to be assertive and to be able to have that conversation. I find most people just don't have that ability in those moments and they kind of go with the process. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, they're kind of, you know, rocking in the corner going, I, I wasn't ready for that. Oh, that sweater I wanted from from you know the cupboard and I, I didn't get it because I didn't have time to think or to process yes. of what I wanted or who I wanted to give things to. Mm -hmm. So your so easy answer what do people need to do? Perfect example is what you did. What can people do though if they don't feel like they can articulate that? It's almost a little bit of try and pick your battles to slow it down. Just don't be available and be very even if you can just get the words out of I need to do this with you. Don't do anything without me. But I just, I'm, I'm just, I'm flat out with blah, blah, blah this week. I just need a bit of time, even if you have to. I'm not a, not saying lie, but if mm. you can't articulate, I need you to slow down and you just have to say, I'm busy at the moment and I have to come back to you on the weekend. I can't do this during the week. 
giving yourself just spaces because every space you get you might get a little bit more assertive with that end goal being I'm going to have that conversation to say slow down Mm -hmm. I've had situations where you know whole houses have been cleaned out you know and done while another family member's been away and because they went away it was like oh well that's tough you're away we needed to get this done here's your pile that we decided was for you and that's for a father so you know absolutely oh disgusting gosh. i don't yeah. know that i could ever get over that that would be and that's where so but that's what i was about to say and this is where a lot of the times then the family conflicts happen is because yes. people won't communicate i need some more time mm. and unless now there's something urgent if the house has to be you know put up on the market for some urgent financial thing a lot of the times it's like we'll pack it all up and put it still somewhere it doesn't have to be even sorted or divided if you don't need it to Mm. You know, mm. there's still solutions even if there's crisis situations that you yes. need to do it quickly in. There's yes. still always the solution. Yes. yes. But it's being assertive and it's just really finding that moment to try and have that conversation. Otherwise, long term, you will possibly not have those family members in your life because you'll yeah. be so angry that they took that moment away from you and mm. took away your opportunity to sort through these this last piece of your person that you won't recover from that. So That's try exactly your best. Right. Be assertive. Yes. Yep. Yes, yes, because the thing is, once those things are gone, they're gone. They're gone. You can't replace them. And for me, the family relationship with my brother, who I love and adore, that would be a terrible loss And again. Mm-hmm. I, and mm-hmm. that's why I think I found, well, I am kind of an assertive person anyway when I need to be, but it was very important to me to speak up because the relationship mm-hmm. was important. Yeah. If I dismissed yeah. how I felt, I would have been dismissing how I felt about him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yes. And then what yeah. about when it comes to children? Because mm-hmm. children go through loss too. Even though children, mm-hmm. they may have both their grandparents never lost a family member, but they may lose mm-hmm. a pet or a mm-hmm. friend of theirs moves away. So they do go through loss. How mm-hmm. do we explain, okay, how do we explain the big one, death to children? Mm-hmm. What's the best yep. way to handle that? So, look, I think there's lots of beautiful resources out there with, with kind of where people, if it's people or pets, what happens? And I think this really depends as well on a lot of your spiritual beliefs and what you want to educate your children on. Sure. I think the most important thing is is also is just giving them a sense of, a belief of this person was important to them, whether it's a pet, an item, you know, a friend, that this was a really important person, object, thing in your life and validate that you're allowed to be sad that they have now gone. So if you've got the spiritual belief side, <clears throat> you know, you definitely can add in, you know, the rainbow bridges, the 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 heaven, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Hopefully it's not a bad relative and they've gone to hell. That might be a bit harder to explain to kids. But, um <laughs> Kids these days know a lot. I think we've got to stop being scared and you've got to be directed by their questions. So if you have a little kid who just wants to know, you know, where, where's, 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 where's Nonna gone? Where's Nanny gone? And you say, well, you know, you know, well, Nanny's, Nanny's passed away or Nanny's, Nanny, Nanny died. Um, so she's not here anymore, but my belief might be, you know, but she's up in the stars and she looks down on us. And then you can say, have you got any more questions about that? And even a four or five year old will either say, no, that's good. Which star? Or they'll say, well, yeah. Well, how did she get there? Well, you know, sometimes as we get older, our body, just be honest. And you just give mm. the small amounts of information. And as they get older, they'll want a lot more. Mm. Um, but never dismiss it. We, we recently lost a, my daughter's first pet. And, oh, oh, God, it was devastating. Pet dies in her arms. It was, it was the whole deal. Oh. Wow. And I just had to that. sit with her and as he was taking his last breath, oh, it was dramatic. You know, you think, oh you, know, you just, you know, let's not compare deaths, but mine was dramatic. Um, it was. <laughs> no, but for a child. And he's taking his last breath and I, and I was there and I said, you know, he's going, honey, he's going. You just need to quickly say whatever you need to say to him because he is going. And after that, I just went, what do you need? And she just wanted to go and have a shower. And in the shower, she was singing a goodbye song to him. And I'm out the side, like, <laughs> bawling my eyes out. And I am just kept on saying to her, what do you need? What do you need? And what do you want to do with the pet? Do you want to bury him? Do you want to... So many things you can bloody do with pets these days. Um, what do you need? 
and what do you want to do? And then we use the rainbow bridge because she hadn't learned about animals crossing the rainbow bridge. So we gave her that story and I just gave it to her to read and said, any questions? And she was fine. She wanted to, to do that process. You know, obviously people, you, there's lots of, do they come to the funeral? Do they not? They're questions that you have to answer as a family and yes. you just have to see. But I think these age with kids, any child you've got in your household these days over really the age of about five or six I'd be checking with them these days and I wouldn't have said that a decade ago I would be saying a decade ago you make the decision for kids these days they talk they google they know so much you need to also just explain the process and probably I would be saying to my eight-year-old if it was a family member how do you feel this is where we're going to go we're doing this for this reason do you feel like you'd like to come and do that it's a very sad you know it's a sad day it's a hard day mm. would you like to do that or would you like to stay home because either option's okay for you yes so just talk yes. to them yes yeah. yes well because my grandsons are six and eight and mm -hmm. they came to we had a catholic mass mm -hmm. my mom was very staunch catholic oh god a 10 hour episode for a five-year-old lucky actually, them <laughs> it was actually an hour and a half and okay, then, that's the, getting better. Yeah, I know. And then, <laughs> then they wanted to be involved in the offertory procession. Mm -hmm. So yep. they got up and <laughs> brought the gifts to the altar. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were fine with all of that. And they yeah. got to experience what it was like and how mm -hmm. we were allowed to cry. Uh, mm -hmm. But also the, the joy. There were moments of great joy when we talked about their nonna mm -hmm. and the only thing was that we made the decision not to take them to the cemetery because mm -hmm. it was yep. a burial and we thought mm -hmm. definitely you know that they don't mm -hmm. understand and don't have the capacity yeah. to make a decision around that and I think that would have been traumatic but they did yeah. come Mm -hmm. And that's a decision that the family's made and the family's happy with. And that's what we've got to keep remembering is as parents of children, you know, we are still the parents and we get to make those decisions. You're not going to be able to open a book or ring your favorite psych and say, hey, should I take a six year old to a funeral? We're not going to answer that question. We're going to say, what do you think? How do you mm. feel? Will this be how have you talked to them about it? Yes, it's just it's involving them in the experience. But the great thing with our little kids, though, we've got to remember, they're not stuffed up by their brain yet with blocking their emotions. So they will process it a lot better than we will as adults because they will do what they need to do. They don't block any of these stages. They don't block emotions yet. So don't be scared of your kids also feeling or going through, you know, those emotions, yes. um, you know, as a, as a young person. It's important. Yes. And I think the fact that they don't block emotions, it does make them far more resilient, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I think that's where yeah. we lose our resilience is when we mm -hmm. try to... We stuff it up, yep, and block we, it. We really block it and mess things up for ourselves. So we're coming yeah. to the end here. So if you were to give us one piece of advice in mm -hmm. regards to us dealing with our own grief, what is mm -hmm. something that you feel is highly effective we can actually do? So I know mm -hmm. when it comes to, say, uh, the stress cup, and we've talked about stress, you've always talked about, you know, are you exercising mm -hmm. and releasing some of those happy endorphins? Is there something yep. like that that we can physically go and do? I think in those early stages, we need to get back to basics. I often tell people, even with the basic food, just try and get something into you, even if it's now back to your favorite bags of lollies. I don't care. Go and get them, put them in your bag or around you, and every hour, throw a lolly, a bit of sugar into your mouth. I know sugar is all banned and illegal yes. these days, but whatever. And it's highly addictive. You create Oh, whatever. Addiction. Whatever. <laughs> in this moment, we're allowed it. Um, it's it's basic. So it's, it's doing that. It's, it's sleeping when you can, if you can. If you can't sleep, have the TV on and just rest. Um, it's, you know, it's it's just making sure that you, you know, you're hydrated. It's just, it's really getting back to those basic. But then the main thing is you have to be allowed to experience the emotions. So I guess it, it really comes down to if you're, a, if you have to do other things, if you have to keep, you know, keep it all together, if you have to still go to work or look after others or hold it together or organize the funeral, then that's all fine. But promise 
yourself that you will go home and you will put yourself in that hot shower and you will just cry your eyes out or scream into a pillow so stress cut we always talk about the importance of releasing emotions and we try and you know put that into our weekly kind of or our daily life anyway this is this needs to be daily and it needs to be intense so i don't want people just kind of going oh that's okay i'm just feeling a little bit sad like that's bullshit you need to be no i'm freaking shit and if i need to hold it in in front of you you don't need to see me when i'm in my car and i'm just going absolutely crazy anger and sadness and heartache doesn't release by just going i feel sad it has to come out intensively and you need to release it intensively mm-hmm. yes and that's being normal and sensible that's yes. not being crazy or something wrong with you if you're not doing that in grief and loss then i think there's something wrong with you <laughs> Well, when you said earlier on about the spectrum of where it it is on the spectrum Mm -hmm. of the worst thing that can happen. So, Mm -hmm. of course, then the way you, you know, everything Mm -hmm. else is going going to be intensified as well. It kind of relates to the intensity of what you're going through. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what about just say, for example, some of us as teachers, because a lot of Mm -hmm. the listening audience is from the voice community. So there's a lot of singing teachers, a lot of people who are Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. speech language pathologists who are dealing with patients. How do we then address it with our patients, with our students? Is it the same way of acknowledging, validating? If if you're going through something and need to get to work or if they're going through something? They are, if they are and they come to us. Yep, exactly the same. Just validate how are you feeling, and are you and, and what, what? So if they say oh, I'm just still feeling a little bit sad today, then well, what what do, what would help with that? So saying even your singing community, well, what would help with that? Is this something now that you need in this moment to actually put that into a song? Do we find the saddest song we can do right now, and I'll help you sing it, and we'll just ball our eyes out together, or I'll support you while you're trying to get through that moment. Or do you need a little bit of a distraction in this moment because this is a bit of joy for you as long as you know you're going to be releasing it and I can see that you're not blocking it too much. So you can actually really use your skill set to support them and help them in that moment. And again, don't be scared of that. So, you know, like that you said, running out of a Pilates class, you just needed maybe someone to go, hey, are you okay? What do you need? I'm okay. I just needed a moment. Now I want to come back to class. Mm. That's what you need to do in your class as well. If they're in the middle of a song and they need to have a, a cry or they're doing some speech work and they need to stop for a moment, just say, are you okay? And don't jump to the conclusion that you're not okay, so let's finish the lesson. You know, just say, are you okay? Do you want to keep going? Do you want to swap to something else? What do you need to do in this moment? And they will tell you, just listen. If Ah. they say, no, I'm fine, let's keep going. Don't then jump in and go, no, no, I don't think you are. Why don't we just go and get a cup of tea instead and we can just, you know, call it a day. Listen to what they want and follow through with what they want. Great advice. Excellent advice. And that's something that our community can do a lot better is listen to our students irrespectively whether they're going through grief or not we can all listen better it's not about us <laughs> but donna thank you so much for your time again you're the first guest that i've invited back a second time so Yay. i know right so i'm i don't know if i've Very got special. an award yeah you are i don't know if i have an award for that yet but i'm sure that i'll just send a bottle of wine it's fine <laughs> Only if I can drink it with you. But when you you not only deal with loss and grief, you deal with the whole spectrum of everything, every emotion, every psychological mm-hmm. problem that people are going through from eating disorders to family counselling, everything. And we're going mm-hmm. to share your links in the show notes if anyone wants to have mm-hmm. a session with you. You can do so via Zoom if they're not in Melbourne or whatever online platform that you use. And because I know that I know people that have been on ships and had sessions with you. (laughs) Oh, I go everywhere. And I'm very happy to, you know, be transported over to those beautiful locations. You just have to obviously pay for my fares. 
you know, I need to be relaxed, so it needs to be a, 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 a for at least business class or above. But, you know, no, no I think I'm worth it. Oh, definitely. Well, you, <laughs> you're back here a second time. You are worth it. <laughs> yes, definitely. No, thank you so much, Donna. I really appreciate it. No, thanks you for having me. All the help you've given me and my family. I think we all have you on speed dial. You're like that person that, oh, I think we just need a moment with Donna. <laughs> and and I think that's a, there's a lesson in that too because sometimes mm. you you do get stuck in life and there's no shame in admitting no, not at all you know I just don't know how to sort this out I don't know the mm-hmm. best way to move forward in this situation this is not something I've dealt with before it doesn't mm-hmm. even have to be a huge ticket item but if it's something that you can't get rid of something you can't shake off don't live with it for the next six months yeah. You can do yep. something about it, and I've learned that lesson. So thank you again no, for being you on for my speed me. dial and for being <laughs> on the show and making the time. Wish you all the best, and hopefully no more lockdowns no. ever again Never. for anybody. I don't know. We've got monkey. No, 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 no. <laughs> monkeys down there but we haven't had any up here yet <laughs> so you can keep your monkeys i'm just cleaning all the oh bananas out of my cupboard <laughs> yeah get rid of them get rid of the bananas and the bananas <laughs> all right no take it easy donna thank you again. all right okay bye bye, bye.